The clock ticks. Slowly, the cogwheels turn the future into the past. Did time make the clock? Did the cogwheels make the clock? Life of all sorts exists on our planet. Some forms are so small they can swim with ease in the eye of a needle. Yet even these single-celled creatures are incredibly complex. Modern science has shown that they are composed of millions of intricately arranged atoms. But what makes them alive, able to move and eat? A human being consists of at least 10 trillion cells. This conglomeration of atoms and cells has some amazing abilities. It is alive, feels joy and suffering and love. It discriminates between beauty and ugliness and distinguishes between good and evil. How has this come about? How can a mere conglomeration of atoms accomplish such amazing things? Let's delve deeper into the most elementary parts of our bodies, the living cells. This model shows the nucleus, the most important part. We'll be talking more about it later. Every marvelous living creature on our Earth is built of complex living cells. Modern science has revealed some of their amazing inner workings we can now watch the process of one cell dividing into two. Incredible, isn't it? Especially when you realize that the cell is built of dead molecules and dead atoms. What makes them live? What exactly is life? What is life? Um, life rides upon matter and matter has to be highly organized to carry life but there's a, a minimum of chemical organization which is necessary to bear life the materialists say that life since it's made up of atoms and molecules and chemical reactions that life is just simply chemistry and nothing else. Now, we shall have to look into that question very carefully because life certainly runs on chemistry and chemical reactions. But can we say, just because that is a fact, that life is therefore nothing more than chemistry, and since chemistry takes place by chance, that life could have originated at the start by chance chemical reactions. Here is the heart of the mystery of life, the living cell. By dividing and dividing again, they built each one of us. The 30 trillion diverse and complicated cells of the human body are miraculously produced by a single fertilized egg cell. The growth of the embryo is a wondrous thing. Seemingly from nowhere, Complex nerve cells, skin, muscles, blood and bones are built using the blueprints stored within the single cell of the fertilized egg. The moment of birth is at hand. A fantastically complicated series of events has interacted, each perfectly timed to produce the most superb of all achievements, a new human life. We 
are born incredibly complicated, technically precise, a marvel of living, growing machinery. But then, how can they say that life is merely a matter of dead chemistry? Now, if life consists merely of chemistry and nothing but chemistry, the best way to understand its real potentialities is to look at some of the chemical substances of life and then we shall see that it isn't merely a matter of chemistry. Now the most important, perhaps the most important chemical substance in the cell is the DNA molecule. The DNA molecule is a very long chemical molecule and it contains all the information which makes life what it is. The DNA molecule uh, determines the color of your skin, it determines whether you're a crocodile or a cauliflower, it determines whether you're amoeba uh, or an ape, um, it determines the species and it determines the properties of the species in which you find yourself, whatever that may be. Now, how does it do it? It has sufficient information on it uh, in the human being to fill with information 1,000 books, each with 500 pages of smallest print full of chemical information, how to make you and how to maintain you. Now, Look, this is rather complicated. So let's take something rather more simple to explain just how the DNA molecule does work. You all know the Morse code. Now, the Morse code is capable with two letters, a dot and a dash, plus the interval between the two, capable of writing down all the information in the Bible or any other book if you know the Morse code. Now, if you take, say, a simple message in the Morse code, such as S-O-S, -S, dot, 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 dash, 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 and dot, dot, dot. And there you have the whole message of a person who's in distress. Now, the genetic code the chromosomes and the DNA molecule use exactly the same method in principle of storing information on this basis. Here I have a rope and on this rope I've got here dot, 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 dash, 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 and dot, dot dot and I hold it up in front of you and anybody who knows the uh, convention of the of the Morse code will say aha he's trying to tell me that he's in distress S O S now I could use any other sequence I like, and I could use lots more of rope to put in sequences to describe, say, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and you could all write it up, write it all up, on just the basis of using uh, a rope like this. Now, the DNA molecule consists not of one single rope, but it consists of two ropes and the two ropes run parallel in a spiral form and fixed between the two ropes are four letters the four letters of the genetic code and those four letters of the genetic code are simple chemical substances then a very long 
genetic molecule of DNA, all doubled and held together in the middle by hydrogen bonds, which are very weak chemical bonds. And when a cell divides, it simply opens up like a zip fastener, and one half goes into one cell, and one half goes into the other. Now that's a wonderful mechanism to look at, because it means that you can replicate the information of a thousand books with each 500 pages of closely printed information on a system like this in about 20 minutes. You think of typing out the information of a thousand books, each 500 pages in 20 minutes, without many mistakes. The second most important thing about this writing up of the Book of Life in the cell is this, that the molecule is capable of reading itself. Now, when we write a book, we have to get somebody to read it, but not so the cell. The cell makes, in the first place, what are known as ribosomes. And these ribosomes are complicated proteins, and they mount this double helix, which we call the DNA molecule, they mount it. And as they mount these double helices, they feel the information. We can read this with our eyes, and we can feel it with our fingers. So we have two methods of reading this book in our way of doing things. But in the cell, the ribosome mounts onto the double structure and as it feels where the bases are, it spits out, as it were, the proteins which are written up in chemical language and so makes you. Now, the information which this DNA molecule contains is, believe me, not written on those molecules which make up the strand. Biochemists have discovered that there are 10 to the 87th power ways to put together the material in just one human DNA rung. According to evolution, this fantastically complicated molecule, which is just a small part of the whole human cell, came into existence by time and by chance, by trial and error. Could this feasibly happen? The problem is that there is only one combination out of the 10 to the 87th power ways that will work for reproduction. Remember, 10 to the 87th equals 10 with 87 zeros. Most evolutionists claim the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Do you know how many seconds there are in 4.5 billion years? Only about 10 to the 25th seconds. So, if a trial and error method were tried once every second, there would not be nearly enough time to put together even one rung like this in the time which evolutionists say the Earth has existed. The cell containing such a piece of chemistry like this was not made by the pure chemistry of the molecules of which it's made. Therefore, I believe that there is an author which transcends the material, the matter, of which these strands are made, which first of all conceived the information necessary to make a cell, then wrote it down, and then fixed in it a mechanism of reading it and realizing it in practice, so that the cell builds itself from the information which the author of that information put on there at the creation. And so I am, as a scientist, convinced that the pure chemistry of a cell is not enough to explain the workings of a cell, although the workings are chemical. The chemical workings of the cell are controlled by the information which does not reside in the atoms and molecules of that cell. Genesis says, 
In the beginning, God created. He created matter out of nothing. He took that matter and formed it into all kinds of different shapes and forms. Living cells, small living creatures of one cell or more. He created insects, like these ants, always busy in their daily life. And of course, the flying birds, like this little seagull. The Bible says an outside intelligence created matter and created life. During the Middle Ages, some people thought that living things often arose out of dead, non-living matter. For example, it was thought that frogs arose from the slime and mud in a pond and that maggots arose from decaying meat. This fairy tale idea was called spontaneous generation. People thought that worms, insects, and many other creatures were formed by the materials in which they lived. One 17th century scientist had a regular recipe for creating mice by spontaneous generation. He said to take one dirty, sweaty shirt and then add some wheat. Then, after letting this combination simmer for 21 days, you would find that the sweat and wheat had sprouted mice. In 1668, an Italian named Reddy wondered if meat really was the source of maggots. He did some experiments in which he proved that decaying meat would not get maggots unless flies could get to it but few people paid attention to his experiment. It was the famous French scientist Pasteur who later conclusively proved that living things never arise from sterile, non-living matter. In other words, life always comes from life. Today, this is among the best accepted principles in science. However, we find that the theory of evolution is based on the idea that originally life was spontaneously generated from non-living matter. This is believed despite the fact that not a single example of spontaneous generation has ever been observed since the dawn of scientific observation. Evolutionists think that life arose spontaneously in a primeval soup. They believe that the atmosphere of the Earth at the time life arose was a reducing atmosphere and that it consisted of ammonia and water vapor and um, methane. Now, if lightning is passed through a mixture of this sort, it was thought that the basic building blocks of life would arise spontaneously. Miller and Fox, in a series of experiments they carried out in Chicago some 20 or so years ago, uh, tried to repeat this and prove it experimentally. So they took a mixture of methane, ammonia and water vapor and passed an electric current through it and did obtain a number of amino acids which are the building blocks of life and a few bases. Now these bases and the amino acids were thought then to show that life or the precursors of life would arise spontaneously under such conditions. Therefore, they proclaimed, and the scientific world still believes it today, that they produced the, experimentally, the first steps in the spontaneous production of life. Now, is this the case? 
Well, there's no doubt about it that they produce the amino acids spontaneously in the bases. But are those bases and the amino acids they produce the ones which could be used for life? The answer is emphatically no, because life needs amino acids which are of the left-handed sort exclusively and not of the right-handed sort to produce the proteins of life. The similar considerations apply for the production of the DNA molecule, which must have exclusively right-handed molecules. Now, life can't use mixtures because the stereochemistry isn't right. So it's emphatically the case that because they did produce racemic mixtures, that life could not arise spontaneously in a primeval soup of this kind. The stereochemistry is wrong. Although Miller's experiment in the beginning seemed to score a point for the theory of the spontaneous generation of life, careful examination shows that it only complicated the matter. No, the heart of the question, the origin of the information that is stored here, is still a mystery. Because in Miller's experiment, a mixture of left-handed and right-handed amino acids was formed. And when you have a mixture of the two, they simply don't form life at all. Even if you had life in a chain of, say, left-handed amino acids, and you put in a single right-handed one, that one would destroy everything that had been formed. Man, incredibly complex. Behold the human brain an unlikely looking package for the wonders that lie within. If visible to the eye, the electrochemical action of brain cells would probably resemble the random flickering of countless stars in an endless universe. The 12 billion cells of the brain form approximately 120 trillion connections. Yet so marvelously and compactly designed are these cells that the area of brain illustrated here is actually tinier than a single grain of sand. Every cubic inch of the brain contains at least a hundred million nerve cells interconnected by 10,000 miles of fibers. It has been said that man's three-pound brain is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the entire universe. Its capabilities and potential stagger the imagination. Could such a wonder simply evolve by time and chance? The Bible says that when you look upon nature, your mind, by that simple act alone, can come to the conclusion that there is God. So look, and look carefully. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the ground after its kind. The clock ticks, like the chemical substances that carry life. The cogwheels move. Slowly they turn the future into the past. Who made the clock? Perhaps the only logical explanation is that it was someone outside the clock. 
Think about it. Now, you will remember at the beginning of our program, we looked at a model of the DNA molecule and found out that it had to be ordered in a way like a book is, to store the information and give it again so that a life can be built. Now, this information is not resident as such in raw, inorganic matter. So we believe, and we have scientific grounds, as you've seen, for believing that there must have been an injection of information onto matter in order to produce a structure full of information like this. That is an act of creation in instructing uh, matter how to build a cell. Therefore, the man who believes in creation is in no wise disturbed if a biochemist goes into his lab and takes the smallest particles of the earth, the dust of the earth, the chemicals of the earth, and with his spirit, he organizes them up to life and makes a virus or makes, perhaps in the course of time, a primitive cell. He has injected uh, intelligence onto matter in order to do it. Now, when you look at the beauty of nature round about us, here's a clover flower, when you consider that that all grew out of matter injected with information of the type I've been describing, you can only be full, filled with wonder at the wisdom of Creator, who first of all had the sense of beauty to do it, and then the technical ability to realize it. And I'm filled with wonder as I look around nature, round about me, to see how God technically did it and realized the beauty of his own soul in doing it. The scripture teaches perfectly plainly and it fits in with my science perfectly well, that the one who did that called himself the Logos, and that Logos was Jesus. Jesus called himself the Creator who made everything for him and by him. Now, if that's the case, then I'm very happy and filled with joy that he made the creation so beautiful and that he also valued me enough to die for me to become my redeemer as well.